Hey, neighbor. Welcome back to day two. Hi, neighbor. Are- Glad to be back. It's me, Jen Hitchcock from Northern Virginia, and it's you. It's me, Ashley Vasek, still, still the same person as yesterday, and I'm uh, hailing from Boonesboro, Maryland in Washington County. No transfiguration today? No. Okay. Maybe we can work on it by the end. I'll work on that for tomorrow. I'll see what I can do. What are we going to transfigure into? Mm, (laughs) Someone very, I don't think an animal because that's very furry. So I'd have to like transfigure into an actual person. So I'm going to transfigure into my wall. Just kidding. Oh, that would be (laughs) impressive. I'll give you props if you can figure that out. I'm picturing you tomorrow with all of these like gold and blue feathers coming out of your head. I do like face paint all day long. Nice. No one's going to know. Okay. All right. So (laughs) it's great to see you again. Um, And we are today on question two of four. We're going to talk about the quantitative analysis FRQ. Um, And we're going to talk about cabinet appointments. So some things that you may want to touch base with would be appointments confirmation, the role of the cabinet, you know, a little bit more of a continuation on yesterday's conversation. And also if you are like, Hey, I want to know more about today's topics. There's always great content on AP classroom under topic 2.5 and 5.7. And there's always gifts. We come with gifts. We come bearing gifts, right? Yes. We love to give gifts in the digital form. Gifts with a T, right? So If you would like a gift, there's going to be a couple points today where we'll be talking about the FRQ and there's another handout. So that's what the tiny URL down at the bottom is for. But uh, yeah, I don't really have much else to say on this slide. So I'm going to continue moving right along and get into some review. All right. So yesterday we did a really nice overview. And Ashley, thank you so much. It was lovely about. Yes, wonderful. Thanks. Um, Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) about systems of government. And we're going to take it up a little bit and make some deeper connections today. Um, You talked about James Madison. You talked about Federalist 10. You talked about Federalist 51, of course, 70, 78. The rest of those guys we need to know as well. Um, But there's another really interesting way to kind of pull this all together that rests on a bunch of these different documents. And that is the idea that our government is the Madisonian system of government. So again, James Madison, fellow Virginian, coming into the Constitutional Convention, had this rough draft sketched out and really felt very deeply that the best way to prevent a tyrannical government, a limited government, we talked about that last class, was not by creating necessarily a Bill of Rights. That was something that we had in 1689, the English Bill of Rights. It wasn't really going well for people. And he said, it's got to be the structure, actually. There has to be some kind of check. And we talked about those a little bit yesterday. So today is really going to be talking a lot about checks and balances. So if we wanted to understand the Madisonian system of government, we would start at the origin, which is us, you and I, right? We delegate. Now, no one like knocked on my door and said, do you delegate powers? But it's kind of implied, I guess, that we are going to surrender certain powers over to the government in exchange for security, right? All those good things. And we're not going to give it all to one government because that hasn't always worked out well. So we are going to delegate them to do different governments. Oh, yes, Ashley. So Jen, when you said that we, the people are delegating some power to the national government in return for some security, would that be a reference um, to John Locke's social contract theory? I think so. That's very astute. Yes, that's very great. So back to that whole idea of a social contract, which is actually going to connect really nicely because we do get to do an activity that really gets back to reinforcing the social contract. And that is through the opportunity to vote. Now, whether you engage in it or not, that social contract is still there for folks who are, you know, citizens. And so we consent to being governed by our government every time. So we're going to sprinkle some particular 
government powers to the national government, I usually try to bucket them into national security and economic issues. And then we're going to give the rest off to the states. But of course, we're going to create through the Bill of Rights kind of like a fence around our most core rights. And we'll talk more about that later, right? And in order to keep all of this intact, you know, you've got federal and state governments, limited governments with different powers being given, police powers to the states, you know, security and economic to the national government. We also, instead of having us trying to keep track and keep an eye on the government, we ask them to keep an eye on each other. And so we turn ambition upon ambition. And so if you're like, oh, hey, I've heard of that, you indeed have. And that is Federalist 51 right? The rest of these things, these ideas of elections having a major role in it, we're going to come back around and we're going to make some deeper connection to Federalist 10 in a minute. So one of the gifts that you'll note is out there is this guy. Now, you can pause the video if you would like, um, but there's a lot of text here. And so what's more probably beneficial is you go to the URL that has this document embedded in it and you can pull down this document which does um, the best of our ability to organize the different checks and balances. So checks as we know are structures that are in place or processes that are in place that are going to interrupt the exercise of one branch's power by another. Yesterday you talked about passing law in one of the FRQs and that's an example of a check because Congress is given legislative powers, but in order for legislative powers to continue on to their fullest, up comes the president and says, you have to present it to me and I get to make some decisions about saying yes or no as a veto. You also mentioned in the C point that the Congress or that the, the courts can get involved. And so I'm gonna say that one is a little bit, of, a little bit weird right? Because it's not explicitly in the Constitution, this concept of judicial review. And judicial review has evolved over time. So we may have time to come back to that one later, but it is an example of an interruption of power. So it's not a traditional or formal check. And so you'll see all of those different types of things. And then going down, you see the balances, right? The way we're balancing power as it's being delegated from the people to these institutions. So in the House, we balance power through two-year terms, election by the people. The Senate, we balance with a six-year term with the continuous body separated across three classes. What does that mean? That just means that one-third of the Senate is up for election in every even-numbered year. Yes, Ashley, you have a question. I do. So one of the things that I feel like I often get hung up on is we talk about, and we talked about this yesterday a little bit, we talked about separation of powers versus checks and balances. So how would I distinguish between those two and do they work together kind of in unison? That's a great question. So when I think about separation of powers, I'm thinking about the things that have the, that Congress, the president and the courts have been vested. That's a really fancy word for given authority to do. We can find that in article one, section one in clause one, which is the vesting clause, which says that Congress gets the authority to write laws. That right there is a very clear separation of powers. If you look elsewhere, there's really, there are checks and interruption where the president can get involved in, I would guess, slowing down forward progress. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, there's not a lot of vetoes going on on any given presidential year and any given presidential term. And so you don't see that, right, as much. So that separation of power is really Congress legislating, the president enforcing and the courts interpreting checks and balances pop up and interrupt some of those powers as they're being operated upon by the branches. Oh, that, that makes perfect sense? sense. Yes. Thank okay. you. That was a great question. So this document, again, like you said, has a nice way of pulling all of these things together. And you'll see that there's, you know, like the double strikeout under the Senate, which means that it was amended by the 17th Amendment. Um, I think in the document that's online, there's some italicized stuff, which telling you that, hey, this is informal, like the power of judicial review, that's not in the Constitution. So that brings us around to this idea of, well, okay, how did the founders or the, the folks who went about creating this this, in this constitution, 
conceptualize the operation, the day-to-day operation of the government. So I think it kind of seems logical that with this huge national government and this concentration of powers kind of to the center in certain scenarios, that it's not going to be the president who's doing the day-to-day enforcement, right? Like it seems to be a lot for the president to do. And so if we turn to the Constitution in Article 2, Section 1, there is a discussion of the ability of the president to appoint people to help him administer and administer the government, administer the people who work in the government, and execute laws. So those are two discrete tasks. This is another example of the Constitution by kind of the way in which we interpret the words, saying that for the most part, we would expect to find the bureaucracy. Those are the people who are under cabinet level positions and they're working for agencies and independent executive agencies, cabinet level administration, so on and so forth, that for the most part, they're gonna be under the control of the president, helping execute law. But there is an interruption in that to ensure that we aren't completely giving the keys to the kingdom over to the president to the president and you know ensuring that there are some interruptions in those powers and so that comes through with this clause where the president gets to nominate with the advice and consent of the senate so the senate gets to give feedback right to interview to investigate to consider how each and every single one of these administrators might perform their functions and to deliberate as a body and decide, do enough of us agree that this is someone we would like to see running our government? So that's how this section rolls. And in practice, we see that, yes, there are actually um, bureaucratic agencies that are housed under the courts and under Congress, some of the most um, easy to grasp ones would be the Library of Congress. Yesterday, you talked about Congressional Budget Office. Those are congressional bureaucracies, but everything else that we talk about, the Environmental Protection Agency, the um, the Department of Justice, the Social Security Administration, those different types of bureaucratic agencies and administrations all fall under the direction of the president. Yes, Ashley. So does that mean that the Senate has to approve everybody that the president wants to work for him? That is a great question. So we're going to get into some technical things here. It's a little bit off pace, but I love where you're going with this. No, not necessarily. So for instance, there is a part of the bureaucratic agencies known as the executive office of the president, specifically the White House office. And I look at the White House office as people who are really good at specific tasks or processes. So we're talking about the press secretary. We're talking about the chief of staff. They're really good at specific types of things that have to happen on a daily basis, but they're not necessarily technical policy experts. Those individuals who work in the White House office are not confirmed by the Senate. And so there's less of an ability for Congress to do that thing that you love, which is oversight into what they're doing. The other side is if we're going back to some of these agencies, there's a lot of people who work for the federal government. It's somewhere in the order of around 2 million people. Congress would not be able to function (laughs) if they were constantly (laughs) hiring 2 million people. So they're going to hire a very small set of those individuals. And they're the folks who are really up in the upper echelons who are making decisions about the direction that policy implementation will take. Um, Folks down at the lower levels are what we would call street level bureaucrats. And so they're really good at specific tasks over and over again, but they're not looking at guiding policy or coming up with formulations of how policy could meet to fit the demands of Congress or the president? It's a great question. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) Keep them going. All right, so back to this. I kind of teased this a little bit that there were some concerns about having just a few people at the top being able to direct the entire energy 
of the federal government. And I think Brutus does a really nice job explaining to us why this might be a dangerous thing. If you read the yellow parts, the highlighted parts, I hear a faint glimmering of Federalist 10, Mm -hmm. where there's this discussion of these great officers of the government who will become above. And what that means to me is disconnected from the people. There, there's no authority or um, accountability for behaviors. And because there's no accountability, they're going to take the public interest and supplant it with personal interest. And that's where we get this abuse of power um, to oppress the people, to aggrandize themselves, so on and so forth. If you read on, Brutus goes on to say that the individuals who would be drawn to positions like these would be individuals who were ambitious and designing men. And really what that gets at, if you're like, I don't know what this means, are individuals (laughs) who are in it for themselves. Um, They're going to use their power to further their own interest and ambition over that of the collective people. I think here... Also, there are some references to other kinds of theories. We talk about theories of democratic representation. This sounds a lot like elitism, that there's going to be this kind of upper crust of people who have outsized access to members or to people in the government based on power or money or some other kind of demarcation. And they're going to do the things that they want to do because it best suits their interests. It also gets at an oligarchy. It really doesn't feel like it's democratic. It feels like it doesn't really matter. And maybe, just maybe, the republic, which is supposed to be an election-based system of government of representatives, is more performative. Ashley, question. I also wonder if, not really a question, but I also wonder if Brutus is kind of uh, getting at rule of law a little bit, that maybe these individuals might not respect the concept of rule of law because they will see themselves as above it in that very elitist way. That is a fantastic connection. Yes. And rule of law there, what we're getting at is, you know, this unrestrained access to power and really nothing that is built into a system through processes and institutions that's going to restrain that or that's going to interrupt it. And of course, I get back to that interrupting thing and you're probably thinking, that sounds like checks and balances. And you're right, it is. There's a little bit more to this. (laughs) See, every time you say interrupting, I think of that terrible joke. That's the terrible joke. It's like, it's like, Oh, oh, you're I on the spot it's, now. It's I like what wait. it's like knock knock who's there and then you say interrupting cow and then as they're saying interrupting cow who you go moo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That is what I think of every time you say interrupting. Have you been working on your dad jokes over the year? I'm kind of addicted to really dumb jokes. I guess it comes with being a blonde. I don't know. They're the only ones I can oh, understand, but, but who knows? <laughs> You know, those things are not true. All right. Well, I love it. I I hope that you make an opportunity to bring your best dad joke energy to every class. I'll see what I can do. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. (laughs) Okay. Anyways, as I was saying, I mean, before the interrupting cow got involved, um, you're going to hear a lot of what would be Madison, because Madison wrote Federalist 10's response to these concerns that Brutus had. We hear okay, yes, like there is this opportunity for self-interest, but the Senate doesn't have to say yes. It says advise and consent and consent isn't guaranteed, right? So the Senate can get involved in interrupting that, you know, that conveyance of power to people who maybe aren't worthy of holding it. He also thinks about a larger body. And I think I need to unpack this one a little bit because it gets back to Federalist 10 we're not thinking of like a larger legislative. I was actually, I was giggling there because I was like thinking of it very literally, but a larger body that we're getting at here is a larger representative body and a larger pool that it's coming from. So it's more along the lines of the body that we're thinking of is the body of the American people. And since we have not only just representation of small communities, But those small communities have to band together to select representatives. And then once those representatives get to Congress, they actually have to compete amongst each other in order to 
move their interest forward, persuade people to do things. And so that becomes incredibly important in this idea here is that you are diluting the power of factions. And so that's where that Federalist 10 comes in. So our larger legislative body and our larger body of citizens is where we are coming into this. Okay. So then we got that one, check, check, Federalist 10, you see a direct, direct connection. It's almost like a rebuttal, actually not a rebuttal, but a refutation mm. of uh, Brutus. We also come into, well, the U.S. House is too large, right? Like if we're giving it to both bodies and we're putting this intra-branch check, we're really slowing this down to the point of making government ineffective. And we really want to make sure that we're balancing effective government with um, government that can move us forward and restrain tyranny. So those are some competing concerns. But by asking the House to be involved, we're now really slowing this process down and they only are being up for election every two years. So what happens if there's, you know, this intractable concern over an appointee and that person goes unfilled? We would like to see those appointments filled to the best of our ability. Shared responsibility between the Senate and the president makes us have accountability for individuals. And we see that, yes, the Senate can be engaged in impeaching appointed officials, but also the president can fire individuals that are not performing um, to, the, to the benefit of the president's policy agenda. The Senate, finally, is large enough membership to prevent corruption, but small enough to prevent significant delays. So a lot of that Federalist 10 stuff in there. Okay, so in practice, what does this look like? We have the government, at least on a minimum of every four years, doing some turnover in which you have a new president coming in and there will be vacancies in these various appointed positions across the government. There are about 4,000 civilian nominations and 65,000 military nominations that are occurring every four years, every wow. four years. You've got that. You've got cabinet nominations, 500 of them every four years. You've got, at times, it's roughly about two, maybe three vacancies on the Supreme Court, but many, many vacancies on the circuit courts and the district courts. Those are Article Three courts that can be filled. So there's a lot of positions that need to be filled. Obviously, not every single position is going to receive as much attention in the press as the next. So we tend to pay really much a lot of attention to Article 3, the federal judges, specifically Supreme Court judges, and cabinet members. The rest of them, they are important, but they don't garner as much attention from the press because of a diminished national impact. Article two, section one, going back to that, we also see that here the president has power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two thirds of senators present concur. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So let's unpack that. Advice and consent is really important. And again, interrupting the expression of presidential power that may not be beneficial or could be used in a way for self-interest, which we also know as tyranny. Where does this come into play? Well, you see there's a couple of things here that have similar language that in diplomatic powers, there's advice and consent on treaties, and there's also advice and consent on for the Senate for being able to appoint. And I wanted to draw this distinction. It is important if we're thinking about what it is that Congress does, if you look, I'm sorry, the Senate, if you look at the Senate's description of its own behaviors in conjunction with the constitution, it's very clear that the behavior, the process that the Senate is involved in is advice and consent. They are giving advice, they are investigating, they are determining whether or not, whatever the question before them, how it should be conducted, et cetera. And then they show through a vote of consent, yay or nay. They are not ratifying treaties. It is the president's job to ratify treaties. It is one signature, not 50 or something along, along those lines. 
just a sidebar. That's just for you. Just thinking about you. And that's you know. a that's a good distinction. I'm glad you said that. I think that explains it really well because I think when you initially think about advice and consent, you imagine that I don't think I didn't always think of it that, oh, the president is the one signing it, which makes that the ratification. You know, you think of it as, oh, the Senate is ratifying, but that wouldn't be the appropriate word necessarily to use here. They're simply consenting to the ratification, essentially. Correct. Yeah. And so but that tells us there is that in terms of powers, the president actually has more power when it comes to foreign policy than the Senate and definitely more so than the House. Um, the Senate is going to, and the House and the Senate have an important role to play. They have to take whatever treaty has been ratified and enforce it, and, and actually not enforce it, that would be the president's job, but to create legislation to help enable the enforcement of that. But the ratification, that official signatory on the line that says that we are going to treat this as law is something that the president does. Woohoo! fun times. All right. So I'm going to go through this really quickly because you actually did a great job yesterday. And I'm so glad that you did that. But I wanted to take one more stab at it in terms of how the president works with these things. They have express powers. We talked about enumerated powers yesterday. Important to remember that at times you might see them use interchangeably. So use context clues. Um, but there are definitely express powers of the president, like the take care clause, which means that he has to faithfully take, execute, take care to execute law. He's vested with the powers of executing laws. He's the commander in chief. He gets to do appointments. He is going to ratify treaties, et cetera. Express powers, very clear, very verbatim. Implied powers are things, again, that are necessary for the operation of these express powers. And so we would also call them at times informal powers, depending on what we, well, they're all informal powers because they're not, they're not explicitly stated in the constitution. And so the examples that I give there are executive privilege, executive orders, and executive agreements. And then you have these really strange ones called inherent powers. Sometimes they're in the Constitution because we've taken care to say this is important and this is something that should be, this is the process. Sometimes we haven't. So they could be formal or informal. And the best example I can give you, if you think all the way back to the last time you took U.S. history, there is the story of Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase, in which there was this problem because it was, it had to be done. Napoleon was like, I'm just going to sell it off to somebody else. And Jefferson was like, Hey, I need that land because it's a security issue. We've got Florida's with in the hands of the Spaniards. We have sovereign native American nations off to the West. Like this just makes things better for us. So yeah, we should buy it, but he doesn't have the ability to write checks. Right. We talked about that last class. So he kind of, obligated Congress to write a check, which was a little bit outside of the Constitution. It's almost like the Constitution didn't think of a process there. They weren't explicit. So we would call it an inherent. And we can see that, of, that oftentimes they can be at times of emergency. Also, another example would be Lincoln suspending habeas corpus during Civil War, although that one was disputed and eventually taken care of by Congress. Implied powers. Another one is the persuasive Ooh. power going public, right? Either going public to the American people to ask them to contact their legislators, to advocate to march, to do something along those lines, mobilizing folks or applying pressure to Congress to take care, to do some action, usually with policy agenda that the president prefers. Yes, Ashley. I'm thinking that this persuasive power and this going public could also refer to um, that idea of the bully pulpit, you know, where the president is that one singular person that can command the attention of the media and the, the entire nation, arguably the world at a moment's notice. Absolutely. Now that term comes from Roosevelt mm -hmm. and it's a term that he used, uh, not FDR, but Teddy. And so he used that and it's not the bullying that we're thinking of, but mm -hmm. um, it's, it's something far more positive in connotation. Um, and so, yeah, like that's the president using the media to be able to further a policy agenda that they might have. 
And there again, they're they're going, you know, straight to the American people. They're asking the American people for discrete actions, contacting a member of Congress, writing a letter, getting involved in politics, et cetera. In the case of FDR, oftentimes advocating for things that really like really kind of was almost outside of the ability of the government to engage in. So things like meatless Mondays and um, not, buy, you know, planting a victory garden. Um, it's really outside of the president's ability to be able to do those. But the bully pulpit is ena- it enables the president to use their power of persuasion to get people to join in for important causes. Yeah, I like yes. it. Nice connection. Iron triangles, another connection. Oh my gosh, I know. Like, this isn't math class. Why is this here? <laughs> I'm having flashbacks to what like geometry this? and yeah. We're not doing pre-calculus or calculus. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, what we're looking at here, you can tell how far I went in math. Anyways, uh, <laughs> we're looking at here, it's, it, it's a theory, right? And so theories are, you know, based on patterns that evolve over study. And so this is a way of understanding how certain institutions, institutions made collectively of people, are going to engage in relationships that are mutually beneficial. So here an iron triangle is describing the kind of exchange of goods and services from Congress to special interest groups to bureaucracies. And it's not all of them. We're talking about very specific um, components inside of the federal government. So here I would think of maybe if we're talking about, oh my gosh, now I have to think off the cuff of like an example of an iron triangle and I'm drawing a blank. Let's Mm -hmm. think. So like there's help right in the house. There's the health, education, labor, and pension. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would see labor unions would be likely to engage at special interest groups to advocate to do all kinds of things, to give information, to testify, to mobilize their members, et cetera. And labor unions would engage the Department of Commerce um, in terms of trying to find one of those federal agencies that's going to have oversight or authority executing law related to those things. Woo, that one was surprising. I didn't think I was going to talk about Department of Commerce. You got it all out there. It was excellent. (laughs) All connected. (laughs) All connected. (laughs) So iron triangles are more permanent theories about how these institutions interact with each other, whereas issue networks tend to be temporary coalitions that are going to include more than just one of each um, with the goal of a certain policy um, implementation. And as soon as it's implemented, they tend to fade away. And our last stop on our little discussion here has to do with pressuring the government. We've been kind of dancing around this. I want to say that all of these are protected by First Amendment rights, which I think is a really important thing. Your ability to associate, your ability to petition the government, your ability to have free speech, free press, all of those things are helping us interact with policymaking institutions. They link us to policymaking institutions. And so they can be activated in many different ways. There are, you know, parties can engage in direct pressure, um, which is a little bit, you know, a little bit not quite what's on this screen. This is more along the lines of special interest groups. So special interest groups is another one of those linkage institutions. And here special interest groups are galvanized around a particular policy, not about winning elections. That's what parties are for. And they have discrete tasks that they might engage in to either directly pressure pressure policymaking branches like targeted communications, testifying at hearings, or indirect pressure where they're mobilizing their base and they're asking them to engage in tasks to directly, to then directly apply either through targeted communication, calling a member of Congress, et cetera. Okay, so that's a lot. And I'm going to try to get us through the quantitative analysis FRQ. Oh, So four points, four points, right? The first one that we should note is that it's important for you to cite your data in all of these. 
the task verbs are identify or describe. I tell my students, it don't, doesn't matter to me if it's identify or describe. Tell me where you got it from. Treat it all as a describe. Flex your knowledge. Show off. It's the time. It makes sure that if you didn't get it the first time or you had a little bit of an off, like your identification was a little weak, you can usually make sure that you can get that point um, by showing how you know these things to be true. So if there's specific data, cite it. Um, if there is general, like you've got to cite the data, right? Where does this information come from? The B point is asking for you to describe similarities, differences, patterns, and trends. So there's, this is also very important that we're using the data and you're showing that you can actually engage and do some simple math with what's in front of you. So you make sure you want to check the prompt. It might reference something that you wrote in part A, but probably won't. But if it does, just be aware of it. And again, cite that data. So if we look at patterns versus trends versus differences, that's important. Mm -hmm. Differences is usually between two different data points, right? So it's not looking at a holistic envisionment of whatever is happening with your data. Trends are generally showing a change of direction. So if it's a positive association, that means as you increase in value in a unit of measure on the x-axis, you're going to increase in a, in a y-axis as well. Of course, the data is never looking quite as beautiful as this. <laughs> the way that I tell my kids is to kind of put a line where you have as many points above as below in between the different, you know, scatter plot of data sets. If it's a line, if it's a, if it's a um, scatter plot, and that will give you your basic idea or just, you know, just kind of drawing lines to see where is it going. And remember that it's not connecting the beginning and the ending point either. <laughs> you want to split the difference so that you have as many below as above. Negative is as you're moving across a unit of measure on the x-axis, you're going down. So that's the difference. And then you have patterns, and that's some kind of repeating sequence that you can connect back to something. And again, this is a very nice data set where it's very concrete and it's you know anticipatable. We will not be looking at data sets that look like this, but it's helpful. It would be nice, but no. It would be nice. So the C point, we want to ensure that we're drawing a conclusion. And this is a really important question about what it is that the data says and where your limitations in your data set are also. We do not want to draw data points or draw conclusions in which we have to find outside information to be able to support that. So the a point of, in, of drawing a conclusion here is actually we are trying to, in this case, since we have the data in front of us, we are actually trying to prove a theory, right? It's, it's inductive reasoning. So we have the data, we're going from specific to general, um, and we're, we're trying to postulate a, a theory here. It's, it's basically what we're doing here is, is just saying, I see this happening up here with this pattern. This is why I think it is. And you wanna make sure that you're going for the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest to squeeze, because it is the most the best an answer for all of the things that you're seeing on that data set. And then finally, we have explain. And it's either explain how or explain why, peanut butter and jelly versus, you know, why do you eat it? How do you eat it? So on and so forth. Whew, are you ready? Are you ready well, to do I'm some so answering? I'm so ready for the data. Data, data, data. It's my favorite one. <laughs> We're I love ready. It. We're ready. So ready. All right. So take a moment here to pause the video and to look at the stimulus and the prompts. Um, in this set, we're looking at some, it's not a map, right? This is a bar graph. So it's, we're, we should be relatively cozy here as we're taking a look at this. So pause your video and then we'll move on. Pause your video, pause your video. I am an ASMR artist. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> Moving on. All right. So we think here, what are our task verbs? So in part A, we've got identify, but we're going to treat it like a describe. We're going to flex what we know. Um, we've got describe in part all conclusion, and we're going to make sure we stay within the limits of the data that is presented. And then in part D, we've got our explain how. Love it. Great. I like that you picked up explain how.
All right, so we do have some things to do here. I'm gonna, again, have you pause the video and we are going to figure out um, who has the highest percentage of women and racial ethnic minorities serving in the cabinet. Pause your video. All right, are you ready? Yes. Give it a whirl. All right. President Obama had the highest percentage of women and minorities serving in the cabinet. He had 36% of his cabinet consisting of women and 41% of his cabinet consisting of racial ethnic minorities. You did a great job, Ashley. So I am seeing here that the identify point is with President Obama. That's the person who has like, that's, that's the identify you're naming it, but you're describing, you're turning to describe it. And even though it's not in the prompt, it's always the best practice. Cause what if you like misspelled the name or you forgot something in there? Um, it would make sure that you have that point. Right. And so like, if you said the 44th president, you know, something along those lines, um, here you've gone back and you've said, I'm going to describe where I see it. And I see it in 36% of the cabinet from women and 41% from racial or ethnic minorities. Great job. All right, moving on. So pause your video. So are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. All right. So I'm going to say the Democratic presidents tended to have a higher percentage of racial ethnic minorities in the cabinet. For instance, 41% of Democrat President Obama's cabinet was racial or ethnic minorities. This was the highest percentage of any president listed. The second highest percentage of racial and ethnic minorities was found during pres Democratic President Clinton's term with 29%. Great job. So describe again, and here's what I like about this. You have told me the pattern in the first sentence. Democratic presidents tended to have higher percentage. Then you have to show me, this is the first sentence is just telling me, and you're not going to earn a point. You have to show me where you came to that conclusion. And describing means you have to walk me through the data and, and show me where you see those patterns. What are the characteristics? What are the data points that are leading you to think this? And so by saying, for instance, 41% of Democratic President Obama's cabinet was racial or ethnic minorities, highest percentage, oh, by the way, Clinton comes back around with 29%. You're really showing me where you see that you're describing it, which is fantastic. All right, are you ready for your C point? I am. Pause your video. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Democrats have minorities as a large part of their voting coalition, and the cabinets of Obama and Clinton reflect this fact. A president who is a Democrat will appoint more diverse members to their cabinet to appeal to their supporters. Supporters who are diverse and support minorities in office will see presidential appointments and may support Democratic nominees as a result. Fantastic. So again, remember, limitation of the data. We have to be able to say something that shows our understanding of the content, but is fully supported throughout the entire data set. And so it is the most logical thing to say that this seems to point in the direction that Democrats have large minority coalitions amongst their voters. It is in every corner, it's reinforcing that idea. And we're not having to go and find external data to be able to fully support that drawn conclusion, right? Okay, our last point, our D point. Ready? Pause your video. All right, here we go. All right, interest groups that are focused on getting certain kinds of nominees appointed can promote public support from their members to support the president's agenda. For instance, a special interest group advocating for women's issues may suggest the president nominates a female appointee who is favored by the special interest group for a key related cabinet position. The same group can then lobby Congress to confirm the same candidate. By pressuring both branches of government directly, the special interest group can increase the likelihood of a favorable member of the cabinet. I love it. So and explain 
how we're getting into a process. And we see here, there are steps that are happening and we can see a very clean, concrete reference to special interest group and they're doing an action. They're advocating for women's issues that might suggest the president nominates a female appointee who is favored by that supreme uh, that special interest groups for a key related cabinet position. We could see that connection in that process of the actions being taken, but also how that relates back to our data set. So that is lovely. You did a fantastic job. Are you, how are you feeling about this? I'm feeling like I got a four out of four. I love it. I love it. Feeling this confident. Fantastic. So our takeaway here, I'm going to skip ahead to say that if you are looking for a little bit of a clarification on quantitative analysis and there's some things that you would like to have ironed out, I would check back into units two, four, and five. There are some videos there that are going to cover this content for you quite nicely. And, you know, other than that, I really wanted to say um, on behalf of, on behalf of, um, I was giggling before because it said um, large body and I, I laugh because actually I'm six feet one inch. <laughs> and so anytime I, I giggle about that, cause I'm like a very literal person. And I always read that to say like, oh, they're talking about my people, people of height, like here we are. <laughs> and so I couldn't control myself. I just like went right back to that whole thought of like, oh, the people of height were rallying together. <laughs> We're not. No. I am not a person of height. So we're going to one time when we actually get to see each other live in real life, we're going to have to take a photo next to each other to compare our my oh. shortness with your height. Just be prepared because I also, as a person of height, love a good heel. So today I wore a three inch <laughs> heel and I was walking down the hallway with my boss and she was just like, you are a large person. <laughs> I was like, I know nice. I'm, that's that's me. So yay, all my tall yay. people out there tonight, we, we got a shout out uh, when we were talking about Congress. Um, so tomorrow we come back and we continue our conversation with the SCOTUS comparison case and uh, I look forward to it. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.